Good afternoon. This is Dr. Bill Bird, Chief Medical Officer at CGH Medical Center. Thank you for joining me on Facebook Live, whether that's live or recorded. Thank you for joining. Hey, so today here's our format. Uh, we're going to have uh, so an update on COVID, which I'll give here in just a moment or two. And then I want, once we do that, then we'll uh, bring in Dr. Uh, Sam Johnston. And Dr. Johnston is an electrophysiologist uh, who comes to the hospital from Iowa City. So we'll get him in just a moment. So if, let's, uh, let's get into the COVID stuff. And I won't be real long about this. But I do want to just kind of make mention that, uh, first of all, let's, let's show the numbers. Uh, could we, Matt? OK, yeah. And I don't have my glasses on, so I can't read this real great, but I do know that the red is this week uh, on the top graph. And then, there you go, thanks, Matt. And the blue is the week prior to that. And on the bottom graph, the red is the pri previous two weeks, and the blue is the two weeks before that. And I think this is the first time I've shown this to you in a long time, like the last month or two, where we actually had fewer cases this week and the previous than the previous week, and the, this is a lot fewer cases the last two weeks than the two weeks prior to that. And you'll see the positivity rates 4.7%, which is closer to the state average. So yeah, that's, <clears throat> excuse me, I think that's encouraging. I know that's encouraging. So thanks to everyone who's doing good work to try to make those numbers improve. Obviously, what flows in with that is the vaccines and Getting people vaccinated is the best way to get those numbers to continue to improve. Of course, we want folks to behave in a certain way and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, I think the vaccine stuff over time is really adding up. And you look at the national numbers and at the last I saw, uh, admissions for folks over the age of 65 are down 80%, which corresponds, no, no, no surprise at all, to those of the folks who most of those are the folks who have gotten vaccinated by and large. So yeah, it works. It works. So I just encourage you to get vaccinated. I really thought Dr. Steinke did a nice job last week on Facebook Live kind of talking about vaccinations. And so I would encourage you, if you haven't had a chance to take a look at that Facebook Live from last week with myself and Dr. Steinke, to take a look at it and share it with folks if you find it uh, valuable. Uh, oh, thanks. And and also, there was a, a Spanish edition of Facebook Live last week that we had a couple of our bilingual nurse practitioners do. And it's been shared quite a bit uh, and used quite a bit for folks. But once again, if you know folks or want to share it with folks who you know that might resonate with, I encourage you to do so. I thought it was very, uh, a very good opportunity there. So uh, other, the only other thing I want to share about COVID is just our vaccine situation here at the hospital. Next week, we're going to do a first dose uh, clinic, and we have 200 vaccines that we're going to be giving out, and they're Pfizer, which is the one where, and the reason I just mentioned that, and it's going to be an evening clinic. It's going to be from, I guess it doesn't say what time, but sometime like in the, uh, after the usual hours when we would do a clinic. So I'm thinking of like, it's, it's indicated for kids over the age of 16. So if you're 16, 17 years old, and Pfizer is the only immunization and the only vaccine you can get, get vaccinated with Pfizer vaccine, you're that age group. Once you're fully vaccinated, you don't have to worry about quarantining if like you're in a sport or some activity and someone around you gets sick. If you're, vac if you're vaccinated, you're good. So I'd really encourage if you know someone or so, you're someone who's watching right now <laughs> who fits in that bucket, give a call. Or get on the Matt already showed you how to get all that signed up, but get signed up at our clinic so you can come in and get that vaccine. And yeah, you're in good shape. So just keep that in mind next week. And I think it's Tuesday evening. It is so Tuesday evening. Pfizer. I, everyone's welcome, but if you're in that 16 and 17 year old category, it'd be a great opportunity. School's not going on, and you can get there. I'll take any other questions you have as I'm talking uh, with Dr. Johnston about COVID. Be glad to answer those as always. But I think I'm going to transition to Dr. Johnston and begin our conversation about electrophysiology. So there's Dr. Johnston. Hi, Dr. Johnston. 
Hi, Dr. Bird. Thanks for having me today. Yeah, welcome. I'm glad you could be here. So just so everyone knows this, Dr. Johnson actually works for the University of Iowa, and he spends uh, a few days a month here doing work with electrophysiology for us. So we're, we're glad to have him when he comes out. We're, I'm glad to have him here on our Facebook Live broadcast. Jo Dr. Johnson, are you ready for some questions? Absolutely. Fire um, away. All right. We're going to start with the soft stuff. So first one is, what exactly does an electrophysiologist do? So um, Dr. Bird, uh, an electrophysiologist is a physician who is a cardiologist that is a specialist in heart disease, but one that um, specifically uh, focuses on um, heart rhythm diseases. So um, uh, we limit our, our practice uh, mostly to um, uh, abnormal heart rhythms. Okay. So in layman's terms, you're um, a cardiac electrician. Right. So, you know, we often tell our patients that um, we're going to be uh, you know, just as their interventional cardiologist is their plumber. Uh, we're going to do uh, we're going to be their electrician. So um, and um, uh, you know, and a, and a general cardiologist uh, is sort of going to be their general contractor. And we all do some general contracting too, of course. Yep, I like that. That makes sense. Okay, so that's a kind of a unique branch. This electrician, cardiology electrician, uh, that you, this this that you're in. So tell me about how you got interested in pursuing cardiology in the first place, and then what what led you to go down the path of being an electrophysiologist? Well, um, I thought uh, when I was in medical school that I was going to be a surgeon or a general surgeon. And um, although I enjoyed that, I saw that field changing a lot. And I uh, wasn't really sure what cardiologists did, but I thought they just prescribed statins and that sounded boring to me. We, uh, I started dating a woman who I am now married to, uh, Dr. Carol Chen Johnston at Loyola and um, Heinz VA. And um, she uh, was starting her cardiology fellowship. And I realized, um, I believe it was our second date when she had to you know, abruptly leave and go to the cardiac cath lab that it was more interesting than prescribing you know, uh, 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 cholesterol lowering medicine. So as far as you know, she went to the cath lab. Pardon? As far as you know, she went to the cath lab. Yeah, right, yeah. Well, I dropped her off there, so I, I, I think so. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, um, I learned, you know, I, I really, uh, I might not have learned much about cardiology except from um, through her, and um, uh, I certainly had more exposure to it, and I realized that there were a lot of interesting things going on. And, um, I trained at Loyola, where um, there is a particularly strong electrophysiology program, and I realized that electrophysiology combined uh, some of the things in internal medicine that I liked with some aspects of surgery. And there are just a lot of um, there's a lot of um, interesting tools that we use, and um, so that appealed to me. Yeah. So it was the older woman and the toys. Yes, that's right. It's yeah that we've got a lot of toys, so um, um, uh, probably more uh, expensive toys than um, than most physicians. So, uh, in, in some aspects of it, can like for instance, doing an ablation uh, take on some um, similarity to you know the graphics of a video game. Yeah. So, how long did it, that does that toss? process take? I mean, obviously, it's four years of medical school. Then how long of cardiology and then how long of the fellowship in electrophysiology did you have to do? Right. So um, the standard training is to do the four years of medical school, followed by three years of internal medicine residency. Um, and then um, one would uh, um, go to cardiology fellowship and do three years more of general cardiology fellowship. And now the standard is to do um, uh, another two years of electrophysiology training. So um, if you include the um, 
the four years of medical school, then, then you're at 12 years, I believe, if I'm doing my math correctly. Wow. You went from kindergarten through your senior year of high school again. Right. And so, and then when I wound up getting a job, I was middle aged. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. That's a lot of training. Okay. So let's talk about now all these things you have rattling around in your head. Let's talk about some of those. All right. Sure. Okay. Um, let's start, let's start with pacemakers. Um, can you give me some reasons that folks would need to have a pacemaker? Sure. So pacemakers um, are devices that simply prevent the heart from going too slow. And that is a relatively uncommon problem for younger patients, although it exists at some, including some children. It's mostly a problem as we age. And as we age, our hearts naturally go slower. We have less heartbeats per day. Um, but with some of us, um, that happens to a greater degree and um, the heart ends up being too slow. And that might manifest just as shortness of breath or less exercise tolerance, but it could also manifest as someone is passing out and losing consciousness. And when that happens, um, we can make the diagnosis and um, or, you know, uh, another physician makes the diagnosis and then and, and refers the patient to us and we implant a pacemaker and um, with this um, small electronic device that goes in the chest, um, we can prevent their heart from going too slow and hopefully the patient will feel as well as they did, um, you know, in the past. Yeah, for the patients I've had who have it for, who have like, like say a six sinus syndrome and their heart rate is going slow and they get that pacemaker and it perks them right up. So it's a very help. It must be a good feeling when, those, when you give, put a pacemaker in someone who goes, wow, I feel so much better. Right. And it's, it's a relatively simple procedure to put in a pacemaker. And, um, and yet um, it's, it's gratifying because I think in some of these patients, like the, those that you're alluding to have the, the greatest response, they have essentially been stuck in first or second gear for a long period of time, um, may, maybe not, but oftentimes, you know, they think, well, I'm just getting older and I guess this is just a part of it. And then they get a pacemaker after they're, you know, they're diagnosed with six sinus syndrome or some other um, heart rhythm abnormality. And after they have their pacemaker, they get into third and fourth gear and, um, and, um, and they feel much younger. Yeah, how long are batteries lasting these days on pacemakers? Uh, it depends on how long or how much the heart paces. So some people require every one of their 100,000 heartbeats per day to be paced, and other people um, uh, don't require pacing all of the time. So the more we pace, um, the shorter the battery life, but still in, um, in a, a pacemaker that we implant today, we hope to get about 10 years of battery life out of it. And sometimes we can get a little bit more. Okay. Yeah. So it's just like how much you have to keep the light on. Right. That's yeah, uh, it's the same thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. How about, let's talk defibrillators. So um, defibrillators, some people get those in addition to their pacemakers. So who's right. going to, who's going to need a defibrillator to kind of shock your, shock your heart back in the rhythm and stuff like that. Right. So um, just as a, uh, I tell patients that just as the pacemaker prevents their heart from going too slow, a defibrillator prevents their heart from going too fast. So um, some people um, have a weakened heart muscle or an inherited condition uh, or some reason that their heart uh, is likely to go into a dangerous, life-threatening heart rhythm. Um, that originates from the bottom chambers of the heart, from the ventricles. And these rhythms are generally called ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. And they're the sort of rhythms that cause sudden cardiac death. So in patients who have had sudden cardiac arrest and have been successfully resuscitated, we, they, we may put in a defibrillator so that that doesn't happen again. Or uh, more often we identify patients that are at risk of having that sort of arrhythmia so that if it happens, the defibrillator is already in their chest and it can detect that rhythm 
within um, about two and a half seconds and it can charge up its big capacitor with its relatively big battery and it can deliver a shock and restore the patient back into a normal rhythm all within 10 seconds or so. So um, um, it's a, it's a life-saving technology for some people. And, um, uh, and, and those who have had uh, dangerous heart rhythms already or those that we believe are at risk of that, they would get a defibrillator. And it's a common question that, um, you know, how is it different than a pacemaker? And uh, in addition to shocking the heart, all defibrillators have some basic pacemaker function. Some of them have a fancier pacemaker function than others, depending on what the patient needs. So you kind of talked about some rhythm issues. A lot of folks have, you know, they're walking around and they'll feel the heart skip a little bit. Um, when do those, how do you, how do those folks determine if they need to see someone like you or not? Well, um, uh, these patients uh, uh, should, you know, will often tell their primary care provider that they're having palpitations. And um, by palpitation, what I mean by that um, is that it's any awareness of the heart beating. As we sit here, hopefully we're not feeling our heartbeats because if we feel our heartbeat and that's something that happens 100,000 times a day, then it could drive us crazy. So it's something that should, you know, our heart beating should be something that's going on in the background that we're not noticing. But when people are feeling it racing or skipping or thumping or whatever, um, uh, those are palpitations. And when um, a patient has those complaints that um, they often tell their primary care uh, provider about them. And, um, and then we can, um, they can often make a diagnosis or they can do a test um, in the office like a 12 lead EKG, or they can do a little longer monitoring to see if there's, a, if there's an abnormal heart rhythm that's associated with these palpitations. Yeah. So sometimes, sometimes, most of the time, my experience is when we do the workout for patients, it ends up being a benign type of thing. The, the, the skip beats are, are, you know, they're skip beats, but they're usually the benign type. Right. Once, once in a while, we find, though, one that is not so benign. And one of the ways you alluded to this earlier in our conversation, Sam, was uh, something called an, a cardiac ablation. Right. Where you could, you could help out with the electro... Um, with the electrical circuits in the heart. Can you talk a little bit to the folks um, who are listening about what exactly a, a cardiac ablation is and how you go about doing that? Sure. So an ablation, um, a cardiac ablation is where we go uh, into the heart and we make a map of the electrical system in the heart. And um, it's supposed to take defined routes, just like in your house, wiring is supposed to be in certain places. And so we, we know where it should be. And sometimes when there's an extra circuit somewhere or there's something causing a short circuit, we can identify that um, uh, doing our, our testing and we can burn it. Um, or we can use some other energy source to destroy the extra circuit. So um, an ablation, you know, uh, in general, is just a destruction of tissue. But a cardiac ablation is when we specifically focus on um, uh, a circuit in the heart that's abnormal and we burn it to destroy it. And in some cases that can offer a, the patient a cure. Um, and in other cases, um, it can be, it may not be curative, but still hopefully helpful and reduce the burden of their problem. Yeah. So those, that's kind of like the, you were talking video game stuff. I, I, I'm assuming that's when we talk about the video game type of situation that's an ablation type procedure right so we have um, um, uh, mapping technology it's called 3d mapping and, and we have this at cgh now actually where we can move a catheter which is a long thin flexible plastic tube with metal electrodes on it or in some instances a small ultrasound camera we can move these around within the patient's heart and we can see them on our computer screen and, uh, and see the relation of our catheter to the patient's heart while it's moving and in relation to the electrical map um, 
uh, of the patient's circuitry um, in their heart. So um, uh, that's um, that's it has the appearance of a video game. Good. Um, well, what else? Oh, I know. I wanted to ask you. So some patients um, come to your office and you'll say, well, I think they should, you should have an ablation, but other people, you'll say, I think we do medication for this uh, type of condition. If you have some skip beats, how, how do you, how do you figure that all out? Well, um, this is, um, you know, I, I guess as is commonly uh, uh, the expression I, I, we use so much uh, lately is shared decision making. You know, the patients are going to have, uh, there are going to be different solutions um, um, to the problems and um, people are going to have different opinions about what they want to have done to their body. And some people don't want to have a procedure and some people don't want to take a medicine. And um, so we have a discussion. Yeah. And um, so the most common uh, abnormal heart rhythm is atrial fibrillation. So in this case, um, you know, we, we see a lot of people with this um, problem and um, we may uh, choose to treat them with um, medicines because it's their choice or we, uh, they may say, I, you know, I'm a pretty young person and I, I don't do well with medicines and I have a lot of side effects and I want to just go right to ablation. And sometimes it's some, it's some combination of those. Okay. So, um, yeah, good. I appreciate that. Uh, what did I want to ma make sure we talked about too? I think that's the main stuff. So yeah, it's, um, I, I just want to encourage folks to, that they know that Dr. Johnston is, uh, comes to see, you know, comes from the University of Iowa and comes to CGH and sees patients. And he actually, we have uh, just started having Dr. Olshansky come and join us as well. So we definitely have um, electrophysiology services, electrical services for your heart right here in the area. And it's you go to our cardiology department at the clinic to see Dr. Johnston or Dr. Oshansky. So for those of you who are listening, just keep that in mind if you happen to have some uh, rhythm issues that come up. Oh, here's a question. Uh, currently a wait list to see Dr. Johnston. Um, I've heard of patients having to go to Iowa City. Yeah, what do you want, what would you say about that, Sam? Well, um, it, it varies that uh, we, uh, starting with the wait list, um, we have had um, a problem with availability, just like every um, almost everywhere has a problem with availability because they're just not enough cardiac electrophysiologists um, uh, that are trained each year to keep up with the demand of, you know, all of the arrhythmias. And um, what we've done here uh, is uh, we now have, as you mentioned, Dr. Olshansky, and I think um, that has greatly decreased our waiting time. So we're seeing patients um, pretty rapidly, hopefully within um, a couple of weeks um, of the referral being made here. And um, we're also, uh, you know, slowly offering more procedures here at CGH. So um, most pacemakers and most defibrillators um, are, are just done here in, in Sterling because they can be done in Sterling as well as they can be done at the university or anywhere else for that matter. We're also starting to do some ablations here and for the simpler ablations, we're doing those also uh, now at CGH. Uh, for more complex procedures, uh, we go to the University of Iowa where we may need um, more equipment or we may need backup of cardiovascular surgery or um, other things. So depending on the rhythm, um, it depends on whether or not one would have to travel, but uh, we try to maximize um, care locally. Yeah. Good question. Thank you for that question. That's uh, always front and center. Can I, <laughs> it's nice to have the doctor here, but can I get in, can I get in to see him? So yeah, I appreciate that. Well, Dr. Johnston, I appreciate your time. It's been very informative just to kind of hear more about electrophysiology. It's one of those specialties that folks don't really think about or know about until all of a sudden they have a problem and need you. Right. Thanks a lot for having me. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, I've enjoyed talking to you. Yeah, it's been good. So thanks a lot. And uh, for those who are listening uh, next week, I'm actually going to have a guest host here. I'm not going to be around on that day. 
So Dr. Marcia Jones, one of our family practice docs, is actually going to do the interview, and she's going to interview Dr. Deb Bowman, who's one of our OBGYNs, and they're going to talk about osteoporosis, and they might get into a little bit of uh, gynecology-related questions, too. So I encourage you to, to check that out next week on Facebook Live. Uh, until then, thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon. Bye.